So we're going to go ahead and start this intermediate Maptitude mapping software uh, webinar. And I have Maptitude opened up. And you'll see on the screen is the Quick Start. This Quick Start contains the most frequently used functions within Maptitude. And the idea with the Quick Start is that it quickly gets you up and running by doing a variety of tasks for you. What I would like to do um, at this point in time is I want to start by creating a new map that's a general purpose map of the area of my interest. So I'm going to choose Create a New Map in the Quick Start and click OK. This brings me to the Create a Map Wizard, which has two options. The default shown here is to create a map of my own data. I don't want to do that at this point in time. Instead, I want to create a general map of the area for which I have data that I want to get an overall overview on. And we'll see what the benefits of that are. So I'm going to choose General Purpose Map. And when I do that, the lower portion of the Create a Map Wizard changes and gives me additional options. I know that for my business, all of the work that I'm going to be doing is concentrated in the area around Denver, Colorado. And so I'm going to start by creating a map that is centered in that area. To do this, I will choose US City and enter the name of the city where I want the map to be created. In this case, that location is Denver, Colorado. And I click Next. I get an informational screen telling me my map is almost ready. And by clicking Finish, I am presented with a map of the general area in Denver, Colorado. I do understand that many of you have attended the introductory Maptitude webinar. So you may already have some basic information on using Maptitude, have some experience and skill set already built. I do, however, want to go over uh, some general uh, reminders of how the software works uh, for those of you that have been away from Aptitude for a while or have not attended other webinars. Along with my map opening, as you can see in the main area of the screen, a map locator also opened in the upper right. This map locator is centered on the overall region uh, for which I purchased data, which is the United States. The area that my map is currently zoomed to is outlined with this black square. I'm going to close this as I don't need it for the rest of this demonstration. However, this can be reopened if I choose to by going to the map menu and choosing map locator. In addition to the map locator window opening, the tools toolbox opened. This toolbox contains a variety of tools for navigating around and interacting with the map. The very top tool, the zoom in tool, allows you to zoom in to get more detail on any area on the map. The tool below that, the zoom out tool, allows you to zoom out to get a wider geographic area in less geographic detail. The pan tool will maintain your current scale, but allow you to move the map around to a different location. Each of these tools are also accessible using the scroll wheel on your mouse. The zoom in tool is activated by moving your scroll wheel forward or away from your body. The zoom out tool is activated by moving the scroll wheel backwards or towards your body. And the pan tool is activated by pressing and holding the scroll wheel and moving your mouse around. The two tools with arrows will adjust your scale. The previous scale tool takes you back through the various scales you have been at in your map through your various zoom levels. The initial scale button will return you to the scale that your map was at when it was last saved or when it was initially opened if you have not saved it. There are also a variety of info tools located in the Tools Toolbox. 
these tools provide information on features within the map. I will come back to these tools in a couple of minutes as we dive in to what we are doing in today's webinar. An additional item that opened is the Display Manager. The Display Manager is located on the left side of the screen, and it lists all of the layers located in the map. The layers are listed in the order which they are drawn, that giving the last layer drawn the highest precedence or most visibility. The visibility of each layer is shown with the leftmost column containing either a green check or red X or a red uh, magnifying glass. The green check indicates the layer is, is drawing. The red check indicates the layer is hidden. And the red magnifying glass indicates the layer is turned on but is not drawing because the map needs to be zoomed in or zoomed out. Layers can be turned on or off simply by clicking the visibility icons that I just explained. Next to the visibility icons are the label icons, which indicate if a label is present for a particular layer. And if a la label is present, as in American landmass, the label icon is highlighted. If no label is present, an X appears in the label icon. And if labels appear but are auto-scaled, those labels aren't showing because of the current zoom level, there's a magnifying glass within the icon. The next column represents the styles for each layer in the map. Those styles can be changed simply by clicking on the style icon. You'll also notice that the Display Manager has one layer showing in bold. That happens to be Census Place. That is the working layer for the map, and that is a layer with which I'm interacting with directly. If I go to use the Info tool, if I create themes, if I use many of the menu items, those apply directly to the working layer. Again, this is the active layer in the map. The working layer is indicated by the bold in the Display Manager and is also shown in the Working Layer dropdown at the top of the screen. Quickly coming back to the tools in the Tools toolbox, the Info tool will give you information on any features or any feature or features in the working layer, which in this case is Census Place. If I click anywhere on the map, that feature is highlighted. I can see that I have clicked on Denver, Colorado, and I can get all of the attribute information for that feature. The multi-layer info tool will provide me information for multiple layers at any point where I click. And it is expandable, giving information on the side. There's also a multi-layer area info tool, which will provide one piece of information about each area layer where I've clicked. Back to the map that I've created for Denver. Denver is my focus area for my business. I always work in Denver um, and its surrounding uh, cities. And I know that this is really the area that I want to focus my efforts on as I'm mapping. What I want to start today's webinar with is talking about how to narrow down uh, the view set of geographic features which are shown in the map. I know that this area that I have showing on my screen is the general area that I'll always be working in. So I want to narrow down the features so that I only see this area. I don't care about counties that I'm not working in. I don't care about other states or the rest of the country for that matter. All I want to see is my area of focus. Mapitude includes two tools for showing uh, a narrower set of geography than what comes with the software. The first tool that I'm going to talk about is the mask tool. In order to use either of these tools that I'm going to discuss, I need to first select the features that I want to show. I'm going to do that by selecting counties. County should be made the working layer if I want to select features within that layer. To do this, if I click on county in the display manager, right click and choose Make Working Layer, County is now the working layer, and the tools in Maptitude apply to it. I'm going to start by using the Selection Toolbox, specifically the Select by Pointing tool, and I will begin defining my area of interest by clicking on the counties which define it.
this looks pretty good. Uh, this is the area that I really want to focus on. And now that I have these areas selected, what I want to do is I want to change the color because I don't really want them to stand out and to be red. I can change the fill style for the selection set, which you can see is identified in the drop down in the selection toolbox, simply by clicking on the style icon to, to the right of that drop down. The style here matches what is on the screen. I want to change the style from solid to none, so there is no fill. When I click OK, the map is redrawn. The counties I selected are still selected. They, however, are no longer colored in a different way than the surrounding counties. One of the ways that I can narrow the set um, that's shown on the screen is by using a mask. The mask tool, located under the Tools menu and then under the Geographic Utilities menu, will create an overlay or kind of a drape over the top of the map, and it will hide any features behind it. The mask is intended to be the final step when creating a map. So if you have many, many things to do, you should do this step last and always last. To create a mask, I'm going to choose the menu item. I'm going to use the selection on my county layer to create this freehand item. When I click OK, Mask Mapitude reiterates that this is a freehand drawing item and that it can be deleted. So this is one way I can narrow my data. Although I am showing this at the beginning of this session, um, it is for illustrative purposes only. And in a real world situation, I would do this as the very last step in working on a map. I want to delete this mask. And I can do so by activating my pointer tool and clicking anywhere in the masked area. Shape points appear on the map representing the extent of the mask. I can simply hit the delete key on my keyboard to remove the mask permanently. The second way that I can subset my data to the area that I care about is to use the multi-clipper. The multi-clipper is located in the tools menu under geographic utilities. The multi-clipper allows you to cut layers to match the extent of any selected features. In this case, I've already selected my counties of interest. And I can use that as a cookie cutter for all of the other layers of my map so that their boundaries match those in my selected counties. I'm given a list of all the layers open in my map. They're all checked by default. I'm going to review this. Not all of these layers are appropriate or necessary to be included in my subset. I want to leave county and zip code. However, the American land mass is just for North America and has no relevance to my counties in Denver, so I will uncheck it. The same is true for building footprints, about which I do not care, nor do I care about county subdivisions. I'm also going to uncheck MSAs, because I don't have any need for those. The state layer cut down to be a few counties doesn't make any sense. I'm going to remove it. I'm also going to remove time zone. When I click OK, Maptitude will go through the process of cutting these layers to match my selected counties, and I will be left with a subset of files. In an effort to save time in this webinar, I'm not going to run through the multi-clipper at this point in time. The multi-clipper can take quite a lot of time. It is pretty geographically intensive. I am going to instead open up the clipped layers so that we can look at them directly. So the results of the multi-clipper are the map that I have opened. This is my Denver area. And these are the layers that have been clipped out to match my counties of interest for my business. I can use this clipped mask, this clipped, these clipped layers with the Create a Map Wizard. And I'm going to move on to talking about that next. We began the session using the Create a Map Wizard to make a general purpose map of the Denver area. I'm now going to start adding my own data onto this map. To do so, I'm going to the File menu and choosing New. In the New File dialog, I'm going to choose Map and click OK. This is the Create a Map Wizard, as we were looking at it at the beginning of the webinar. Rather than making a general purpose map, this time I am going to make a map 
of my own data. When I select that option, I am immediately prompted to browse for the data which I would like to map. I'm going to start by creating a map of my sales reps. My sales reps are located in this sheet named reps.xls. Once I have selected the sheet, I can click open and then identify the data which I want to use. Having done this, I'm going to click Next. Maptitude presents a match dialog that lets me check and confirm the geographic matches between my data fields and those that Maptitude is looking to get data from. This is all correct. However, if it were not, I could click in any of the matched fields of my data, getting a drop-down, and select the appropriate field whose data contents match the description on the left. I'm going to click Next. Since I have created a map that only contains the extent of my area, rather than making a brand new map, I want to add data to my existing map. Checking this option lets me identify my map, which is shown here. You can only add data to the existing map when you use the options to locate your records, which will place your data on the map as points. If you try to use any of the show options, a new map will be created, thereby graying out the add your data to existing map option. In my case, I do want to locate my reps by their street address. That is completely appropriate. And I'm going to click Next. The ID field for this file is, in fact, ID. That is correct. So I'm going to click Next again. Mapitude prompts me for the, the output directory for the layer I'm creating. I'm going to put this in my training directory named reps. And I'm going to click Save. The next option that Mapitude presents me with is an option to create a theme for my data, which I'm not interested in. I do, however, want to display labels. And I want those labels to show my reps' names. I've finished with all of the options that I know I want to use in the wizard. So rather than continuing to go through by clicking Next, I'll simply click Finish. Mapitude goes through my reps file, which had two records and is able to locate both of my reps using their address. When I click OK, the map is redrawn centered upon the data that I have just located. My two sales reps are shown on the map, Frank Turner and Abigail North. These sales reps are shown using a blue star. In the display manager, my sales reps are appear as the layer named your data parentheses reps. I don't particularly like that name, your data reps. It's not really one I want to show if I share this map with other people. So I'm going to start by renaming the layer. Renaming the layer affects both the display manager and the contents of the map legend. To rename the layer, I will right click on the layer that I want to rename and choose the option rename. I'm going to rename this layer to Sales Reps, and I'm going to make this permanently changed. When I click OK, I'm warned that this will impact any other maps in which this layer appears. That's fine. I'm going to click Yes. In addition to renaming the layer, thus changing the way that it appears in my Display Manager and Map, I want to change the style for my map. I don't want my sales reps to show in a blue star. Instead, I want them to show with a blue circle. I've clicked on the style icon for my sales reps. I'm going to choose a different icon, the one that I prefer, and adjust the size. Clicking OK applies my changes and closes the dialog box. My reps now appear as blue circles, which is much more in line with what I was looking for. The other thing that I would like to do is I would like to display a little bit more information about each of my sales reps on the map. I'm showing their names, but I know, because I know my data, that each of my sales reps has different working hours. 
Um, Abigail and Frank don't both work 9 to 5. Uh, they have variable hours that allow them to have a broader visit time with my clients. I would like to have the labels for these reps, not just show the rep's name, but also um, indicate what their working hours are. To change this label, I'm going to click on the label icon in the Display Manager. Doing so opens the Automatic Labels dialog box. I already have labels on this layer, and that the label field that's being used is the Rep field. Instead of changing this to be one field, I instead want to label using multiple fields. I'm going to choose that option from the drop-down. The fields that I want to label with are my rep's name. I will highlight it and click Add. And my rep's hours, which I will also highlight and click Add. Those are the only fields I want. I'm satisfied, so I will click OK. The multi-line label tool allows each of your lines to be colored differently if you so desire. I'm happy with my sales reps being labeled in blue. However, I don't want their hours to stand out quite so much. I want them to be on the map, but I don't want them to be in the same color as the rep name. I'm changing color 2 from blue to gray. I'm going to click OK. Also, rather than having the label appear to the upper right of each point, I want it to appear to the right of each point. If I want to see how these changes will look and leave the dialog box open, I can click the Apply button. My changes are applied. The dialog box remains open. I'm happy enough with this for now, so I'm going to click OK, which applies my changes and closes the dialog box. I have now styled my sales rep layer the way that I want it to look. Further. I want to be able to reuse this layer in any map and not have to go through the styling again. I want it just to look this way every time. I can do that in Maptitude by saving the settings for a layer. To save the settings for a layer, I'm going to go to the Tools menu and choose Geographic Utilities. Under Geographic Utilities, I'm going to choose Geographic File. In the Geographic File dialog, I should first identify the layer whose settings I want to save. In this case, this is Sales Rep. I'm going to click Save Settings to make those styles permanent. This affects display styles, selection sets, themes, labels, and formula fields for the specified layer. I'm going to click Yes and close the, the Settings um, dialog box. Now that I have my Sales Reps on the map, I would also like to add my clients to this very same map. I can do so using File, New, and creating another map. As we discussed previously, the Create a Map Wizard does allow me to add to the existing map, and that's what I'm going to do this time. The last file that I used, my reps file, is not the one that I want to map this time, so I'm going to click Browse, and I'm going to instead choose my clients file and click Open. I'm going to select the sheet containing my clients and click OK, which takes me back to the wizard, which I will then click Next. I'm going to review these match fields to ensure that they are correct, and indeed they are, so I'm going to click Next again. Since I do want to add these clients to my existing map, I'm going to check the box to do so. And I do want to locate these clients by their street address. Now I know that I don't want any labels, I don't want any themes. So at this point, I've made all of the settings that I need to. And I'm going to click Finish. Once I have a name entered in a location which I'm satisfied, I can click Save. Maptitude locates these records. I had 36 clients in my file. All of them were found. And they will be added to the map once I click OK to dismiss the Locate by Address Report dialog. My clients are now shown on the map, and they are shown on the map as blue stars. The first thing I would like to do is similar to what I did when creating my sales reps layer. This time, I want to rename my clients from your data clients to clients with today's month and year. 
this way I know what snapshot in time is showing uh, these clients are showing. I'm going to make this a permanent change and click OK and Yes. I also want to change the style of this layer. As expressed earlier, I'm not wild about the blue star, so I'm going to change this to a closed square that's kind of a dark rust color and a bit smaller than what it's showing now. So I now have a map showing my sales reps and my clients for the area in which I work. If I wanted to make these style changes permanent, I could do so in the same way that I did previously by going to Tools, Geographic Utilities, Geographic File, and choosing Save Settings. Now that I have both my clients and my sales reps on the map, I would like to begin doing some analysis. The first bit of analysis that I would like to do is to create drive time bands. Specifically, I want to create drive time bands around Abigail North. I know that I want to send Abigail out to start visiting some clients and creating these drive time bands will help for me to get a visual reference as to how far she must travel in order to get to each of these clients. To create the drive time bands I'm going to the tool menu and choosing, choosing routing and then selecting Network Bands. The Network Bands toolbox begins by allowing me to select the point around which I would like to create my bands. I'm going to activate that tool and click on the location where Abigail North is located. I want to create travel bands that are 15 minutes in size and go out for a total duration of two hours. Once I have entered the settings for these bands, I'm going to click the Create Network Bands tool. Network bands are created in 15-minute intervals around the point which I have selected and added to the map so that I can easily visualize the travel area for the point, the origin point, which I specified. These These network bands have been added to the map so that I can see them. They are not a layer that has been saved at this point. Um, they are just drawn as a text annotation. I want to save these bands as a layer so they appear in the left-hand side in my Display Manager. And to do so, I will click the Save Network Bands Layer button. This allows me to create a file name of my choosing, which I'm going to call Abigail Two Hours, and click Save. This layer is now accessible in the Display Manager. I'm done with my Network Bands toolbox, so I'm going to close it. And I'm going to rename these Network Bands from a generic name to something a bit more specific. And I'm going to name it Abigail Two Hours permanently. The last thing that I want to do is to see the full extent of these drive time bands. I can do this by right clicking on Abigail two hours and choosing zoom. This shows me the full area that those drive time bands encompass in my map. This concludes the first portion of this webinar. I'm going to now open up uh, the webinar to questions. I'm going to read the questions as they are asked and respond to them. So uh, go ahead and ask questions at your leisure. And the first question that is being asked is, how can I show a label when the zoom is preventing it? For example, I want to see all zip code la labels when zoomed out quite far. So in this particular example, if we go back to the zoom level that we were just at, looking at the entire area here. My zip codes are on the map and they are not labeled. The icon for the zip codes indicates that the labels are ready to draw and that there is auto scale. If I wanted these zip codes to be labeled no matter what, if I right click 
on the layer in the Display Manager, I can choose Show Labels, parentheses, Clear Auto Scale, for those labels to be shown all the time. If I want to reinstate the Auto Scale, I can right-click again, and go to the Auto Scale settings to reenact what those were. I knew what they were. Um, and I think that they were something like 250,000. The next question, how do you make the renamed sales reps show in the legend? Uh, that happens automatically. Sales reps is here and also here. The next question, is there any advantage to using the mask function versus the multi-clipper function if I want to add data, um, want to use for analysis later? It's an excellent question. The mask tool is generally fine uh, in most cases. It's a lot faster than the multi-clipper. Uh, for this particular data set, which I'm using right now, uh, the multi-clipper took, I don't know, half an hour or something. I can't remember exactly. I, I didn't time it um, at the moment. You saw how quickly the mask tool worked. So the mask tool definitely has advantages in being fast. And it's more than suitable for most users to use as a last step in the map. So I would lean towards the mask if given a choice. I would use the multi-clipper only if I really needed to just use one set of data and understand um, that a lot of time is created to, um, it may be required to create those files. Being asked what MSA stands for, all of the data that are included with Maptitude are um, documented in the help menu. This is the US data, so if I choose regional data help for the US as for the quarter four data, I can get information about every single layer. And I can see that here that the MSA layer, which is listed here, um, somewhere in the list, I'm just not, my eyes are not quite fast enough to see. Uh, however, the MSA layer is documented in what that actually contains. So all of this information appears in the regional help. Being asked to display a call out, um, in this case I'm going to illustrate this uh, using Abigail North. The call out tool is in the tools toolbox, custom labels with call out. If I activate this tool, I can click and drag a label to any location and the callout will be dragged out in whatever location, uh, to whatever location that point was originally located. I could then right-click on the label itself, and I can restore the default location of that label if I so choose. The next question that's being asked is if settings have to be saved for every change. And the, this question goes on to ask, if you can save a map settings with multiple selections in a layer. Just to be clear, anytime you save a map, all of the styles for the layers within it, the styles, the selection sets, themes, feature display settings, so on and so forth, are saved with the map itself. The only benefit to saving settings for a layer is if you're going to, to add that layer to another map that you have created or that you plan to create. If you have changed the settings of a layer subsequent to using the save settings function, then those change uh, settings, style settings, will not apply in the saved file. So you would have to save those settings again. We do have time for another question or two. If anyone has additional questions they would like to ask before we move on to the next session. And this question is how uh, you would open saved settings in a new map. This is simply done by opening the layer for which the settings were saved. In this case, I saved the settings for my reps layer. If I opened up that reps layer by itself or in a map that was already open, then the styles are applied. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next session of this Intermediate Maptitude Mapping GIS webinar. And we're going to talk a bit more about Abigail and her clients. And what I want to devise next is 
um, some strategy for Abigail to visit these clients. And this is what we'll be focusing on for the remainder of this webinar. I know that Abigail has work hours from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. I also know that each of my clients have hours which they can be visited between. I'm going to start by opening up my client data so I can start reviewing some of the particulars for my clients. I can open this client data by right-clicking on clients in the display manager and choosing new data view. This opens the tabular data which stands behind the layer itself. I have a variety of fields in this layer and in addition to the geographic fields, the address, I have some sales information. I have um, also the times that these clients have requested a visit. The time ranges are between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. and 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. A zero indicates no for a client, a one indicates yes. And there are cases where some clients are pretty open. They are available in both time periods. What I want to start with is selecting all of the clients whose availability hours match those of my rep, Abigail, who is available from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. I'm going to select these clients using the Select by Condition command. To choose this, I'm going to go to the Selection menu and choose Select by Condition. The condition that I want to enter is related to the field 12p to 8p. I am going to select that field from the drop-down field list. The criteria is that this field should have a value of 1 in order to indicate these clients want to be visited in this time frame. So I'm going to type the equal sign and a 1. The default name for a selection set is selection. This is not helpful overall. It's good to have a default. However, if you have an opportunity to customize that name so you might remember why features were selected down the road in a saved map, it's always a good idea to do so. I am going to name this set Abigail, indicating that these clients are available in the time range of this particular sales rep. When I click OK, my clients are whittled from 36 down to 21. These are the 21 clients who are available in the time window that I indicated. Now that I have indicated I have narrowed down uh, the clients whose time ranges fall within my sales rep's time range. The next thing I want to understand is how far drive time each of these clients are from my sales rep, Abigail. I've already created these drive time bands as we looked at um, in our first session. So what I really want to do is I want to append this travel time information for, for Abigail to go from her location to the client into the client table itself. I can do this by first making clients the working layer. Since I want to adjust the data within the client's layer, it must be made the working layer. There is a tool in Maptitude that will allow me to append information from an area layer, the drive time band, to a point layer, my client. And this is located under the Tools menu, under Geographic Analysis, as Tag Points by Area. This tool will allow me to specify the, the features that I want to amend information for. In this case, rather than doing this for all clients, I only want to do this for the clients that have been indicated as being in Abigail's work time. The data that I want to add to these clients comes from the network bands layer named Abigail 2 hours. And specifically, I want the travel time 2, so the 2 band that the time is located in. When I click OK, Mattitude goes through and adds to my client table how long it will take from Abigail for Abigail to reach each client. So I can see that these times range from 15 to 60 minutes. In addition to needing to understand the travel time to each client, I also have included my anticipated visit time. 
Abigail has to do more than drive to see these clients. She's going to sit down and spend time with them and address their needs and try and, and make sure that they have all of the selections and, and products that are appropriate for their business. So in order to come up with a good total visit time for each client, I really need to make a new field which combines the visit time with the travel time so that I have a better idea of the requirements that I'm putting on my sales rep. I can combine two fields using a formula field, and I'm going to do this by going to the data view menu and choosing formula fields. Formula fields allow you to create a new field on the fly, which is constructed by using existing fields or portions of existing fields data. In my case, I want to add the value of my anticipated visit time with the value of the travel time. The default name for this field is formula. This is not very descriptive. If I come back to this map later, I probably won't know what that means. So rather than naming this formula, I want to call this total time. When I click OK, the values of the two fields are added together in a new field that has been created on the fly. You can see that 30 plus 30 is 60, and so forth. If any of the two input values change, the total time will update automatically. My next task is to figure out the visit order for these clients. And the way that I want to do this is I want to visit my clients based upon the sales and how long it's going to take to get to each client. So the first thing I want to base this on, the primary objective, is the travel time that my sales rep has to get to each client. This is contained in the Abigail 2 hours 2 field. And I also want to be able to base these visits on my client's total sales. So I'm going to sort on two fields at once. I can do this by going to the data view menu and choosing sort. I want to first sort based upon the uh, time two. And once those time twos are sorted, I want to then do a secondary sort on the total sales. Having done this, I can see that my first customer to be visited is 15 minutes away, has total sales of $377,000. The next one has total sales of $615,000. Now that I have sorted these visits, I want to rank them based upon this sort order. My table already had a rank field. And I'm going to simply fill this in with the visit order based upon the sorting that I have done. If I click on that rank field, I can right click and choose fill. I can then fill my rank field sequentially starting at 1. So I have now ranked these customers from 21 based upon the combination of their travel time and sales. Now looking at these times, 60 minutes up to um, 120 minutes for a visit time with any, any particular client, I know that it's not reasonable for my sales rep to visit all of these clients in one day. My sales rep has an average work time of eight hours, which is 480 minutes. And I can't really expect that sales rep to work beyond that. So the next thing that I want to do is figure out which clients Abigail should visit. And I want to start at the top. I'm going to start with the very first set of visits and go forward. To do this, I'm going to start selecting clients and have Mathitude calculate a summed total time in order to determine if that set of clients is going to be enough or too much. So I'm going to just pick these clients, select them by clicking on my selection icon in the data view to the left of the clients. I've picked seven of these clients. And I'm going to focus on them. This is my set called selection. So here's the seven. And I want to see what the summed travel time is, to the summed total time. And I can do that by going to the data view menu and choosing summary statistics. My total time here is 525 minutes. And that does exceed um, what I want to use for Abigail. I close these results. And I just want to remove um, number seven, rank seven, from my list. I can do it by clicking 
on the selection icon on the map. So this is no longer in my set. I'm going to choose summary statistics again. And now my total visit time for Amanda for the one day for these six clients is 450 minutes, which is reasonable. If she hits traffic, if a visit goes long, it gives her somewhat of a buffer. Um, it also allows her some time to have some lunch. So I'm going to close this. I've now established the order that I want to visit my clients in, as well as the clients that I would like to visit. I want to just do a bit of bookkeeping before I go on too much, just so that I have my I's dotted and my T's crossed. And I'm going to assign Abigail um, as the rep for these six clients by clicking on the field heading for assigned rep and clicking fill. I'm just going to type in Abigail's name as the identifier for the rep. I'm also going to assign the visit date because I know that I want Abigail to visit these particular clients on Friday. So I'm going to choose that date and click OK. So now I know the dates that Abigail has been assigned to visit these clients, and I'll be able to give her multiple assignments on different days. So I have the set all filled out. And my last step is that I want to figure out the best order for um, Abigail. Uh, I want to figure out the order that Abigail is going to uh, be driving, the street order some directions for Abigail to get to these clients. When I click on the map, I can see that the clients that Abigail is going to visit are displayed in green. If I want those, to stand, those clients to stand out more, I can expand the client's um, layer in the sets, and I can very easily change uh, this, these selection colors if I so choose. In order to get driving directions for Abigail's visits, I'm going to go to the Tools menu and choose Routing. And I'm actually first going to do this with my streets as the working layer. This working layer is always very important. The menu items are attached to what's appropriate for a layer. You'll notice that before when I chose the routing option, it wasn't there. Uh, shortest path wasn't available because my street layer wasn't the active layer. So it's always good to pay attention to that working layer. Now that streets are my working layer, I could choose shortest path. I want to start the shortest path with Abigail's location. I'm going to use the Add a Stop tool to click on Abigail. I also have created that selection set in my client's layer. I can add, identify those clients as stops using the Add Stops based on a selection set. The layer that I want to use is my client's layer. The feature set I want to use is that selection set with six records. I can tell Maptitude, uh, Maptitude how these clients will be ordered based upon the rank field, which I filled in previously. And in my directions, I can identify the customers by their name. I click OK to go back to the, the shortest path toolbox. This path is taking me all around the map, but the one other thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I get Abigail back home. I want to give her directions to get home. So I'm going to add one more stop, which is Abigail's home once again, to give her a round trip. I can see that I have a full route on my map, indicating the travel area that Abigail will be traversing, at least for this first day of client visits. And I can now output driving directions. These driving directions are based upon the client name, because Abigail did not have, uh, was not part of the layer itself, her address is referenced as the starting point, but the customer's names are referenced for the rest of the directions. And we have directions all the way back for Abigail to return home. I've now concluded the second part of this webinar, and we'll open up for questions. And as we answer those questions, be sure and add more as they come up. Um, so the very first question is, uh, how would you contrast the demographic characteristics within a buffer or band with the demographic characteristics of the area that falls outside the buffer or band within a larger area? And the, the question goes on to say, if you put buffers around data points of data you enter within a county. So what the question here is for, for people that 
are if you want to do an analysis of people inside and outside of a buffered area. And uh, this is an excellent question. And there are a variety of, of ways you might approach it. Um, unfortunately, this is sufficiently complex that it's not something that we'll be able to address in this particular webinar. Uh, it's a little bit more in depth and isn't really in keeping with the topics for this particular webinar. So uh, what we'll do is we'll take note of the question with regard to buffers and bands and surrounding areas, and we'll do our best to incorporate it in another webinar um, in the future. And we do appreciate uh, that input. Other questions that you might have based upon uh, what we've talked about today in this Intermediate Maptitude webinar. Okay, I'm not getting any other questions right away here, so I'm going to go on to show you um, a bit more of what, how we might be able to use this data outside of Maptitude itself. I have, at this point, I have a map that contains the uh, drive time bands as well as my clients and my sales reps. Now, I may just decide that I want to be able to use this outside of Maptitude, and I want to do it in an interactive way. And I'm going to start by closing the shortest path and zooming out a little bit. So let's go back to the overview for this map. And here I have my map of my various points. And I'm going to just turn off the highlighting for Abigail and my selection by changing the visibility uh, using those display icons. So here I have my sales reps and my clients. And I want to be able to use these in an interactive fashion outside of Maptitude. I can do this um, by using uh, the, the file Save As utility to save this map as a Google Earth document which is compressed. And I am going to call this Denver Data. When I click the Save button, um, I'm immediately presented with a bunch of options. And in this case, by default, all of the layers shown on my map would be used. And, and that is not at all what I wanted to have happen. So I'm going to click Cancel. And I'm going to start out uh, by modifying this map. I'm going to hide everything I don't care about sharing, because I don't need to share all of this, and get this map down to the features that I do want to share in Google Earth. I'm going to do this through map layers just because it's going to be a little bit faster. And go ahead and hide all of these layers that don't have data about uh, that I want to share with other people. So let's just go ahead and zip through here. And so I have everything hidden in this map with the exception to my sales reps, my clients, and my travel time bands, which is, which is exactly what I want. So I want just this amount of data to show in Google Earth. If I go to File and choose Save As once again, I can choose this Google Earth document and give it a name. And I can select any of the attribute fields that I want for my particular sales reps. Um, in this case, I only want the rep field and the rep to be the feature name. Um, so we'll just have the rep field and the hours for each of my reps. For the clients, I'm going to have their customer name and their visit date and assigned rep with the total time, because some of this information is sensitive and I don't want it all included. And then I'll use everything for my Abigail two hours. When I click OK, this KMZ file is created and saved. And Google Earth is launched with this new uh, KMZ file automatically displaying. So here I have in Google Earth um, a series of layers. 
And these layers include my sales reps, my clients, and my travel time bands, so that I'm able to get some really good information um, showing me where these, these folks are located. And so if I zoom into a particular area, I can see exactly where my clients are. I can get information about those clients, the rep assigned, the total time required, um, and who is going to be visiting them. I did, I did save the full set of clients, so in this case it has a little bit more. Not all the fields are populated. However, I'm still getting lots of good information, and I can go to any customer and see where they are located. We don't seem to have any other questions, and I'll give you an opportunity um, to ask any more if you desire. In absence of any more questions, I do want to say, and I'll give you this opportunity to type as I continue to talk, this video for the training will be made available to you within a few hours of the training. You'll receive an email letting you know information for downloading the video. We also include a link to a survey that will ask you about this, this webinar and your experience with it. We value and appreciate your feedback and do ask for any comments that you might have. And I appreciate all of the time that you all have spent uh, attending to this webinar attending this webinar today. We are uh, we do have a couple of other questions uh, that we'll get to quickly before um, this this webinar ends. Uh, there was a question about adding data to an existing map. Um, there are a couple of ways to do so. You can add data to an existing map using the Create a Map Wizard, and that is done by going to the File menu and choosing New, and then choosing Map, identifying your data set, and how you want to locate it. The other way that you can add data to an existing map is to go to the Map menu and choose Layers, and then choose the Add Layer button. This does conclude our online training, or the online webinar for any intermediate Maptitude questions. I appreciate your attendance. I encourage you to provide us feedback via the survey. Uh, we look forward to working with you um, in the future. Please, please know that in addition to the webinars, we do offer online training for Maptitude. This online training 